Great. So I've called this topic this evening How to Use the Catechism Like a Ninja Warrior or a Jedi Knight or whatever metaphor you want to use because I'm assuming you don't know what a Ninja Warrior is, do you? That's kind of 1970s or something, um, showing my age. You do know. You've heard... You don't know what a ninja is. Great, good, good. We're on the same page then. Look, this is this is this is our last session before the Christmas break. We've had two or three wonderful discussions about content, so I thought we'd go back and do another session tonight about methodology. In other words, in general, how to help you in your conversations, in your apologetics with other people. And I just thought we'd finish with the catechism. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of introduction to what the catechism is just because some of you haven't heard this before and then I want to emphasise very practically the structure of the catechism how to use it, how to pick it up, how to touch it how to get the most out of it um, and then to have some discussion and some questions Okay, great so just in case you don't know much about the catechism here it is, I'm waving it around how many of you right, have got a catechism, a big catechism, not the UCAT? Hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe. Not sure. Tomorrow is unsure. You, yes. Okay. So about half of you have got a big catechism, which is fantastic. A bit of introduction. What an incredible gift that we have, the catechism of the Catholic Church we maybe take it for granted. It's not an answer to every question. There are an infinite number of questions. But when we're searching for the basics of our faith, our worship, our moral life, our prayer, there is sure guidance here that we can trust. And many Christians don't have something like this catechism. So just above all what an amazing gift it is and if you don't know it I hope that just being here this evening is a prod for you to appreciate it more and look it up what is a catechism it's a book or a text which contains fundamental Christian truths in a systematic way in a language understandable to contemporaries in our case this is our catechism for our time it derives from the word catechesis which is often used today to mean to teach you do a catechetical program maybe but a deeper meaning is a word that in ancient Greek was used in reference to the theatre and it means to make resound like an echo to resound so this is about the Christian faith the witness of the church about Christ himself finding an echo in the hearts and minds of believers and becoming real and personal for them and interiorized. In other words, it's not just learning dogmatic truths, it's, it's the truth and wisdom and beauty and life of the faith resounding, echoing through our lives, our hearts, our minds, our souls and, and becoming part of me and part of us as a community. Why do we need it? Isn't scripture enough? Good question. Well, John Paul II wrote, A catechism should faithfully and systematically present the teaching of sacred scripture and of the living tradition of the church and of the authentic magisterium, meaning the teaching of the church as well as the spiritual heritage of the fathers and the saints to allow for a better knowledge of the Christian mystery and for enlivening the faith of the people of God. It should take, continuing the quote, it should take into account the doctrinal statements which down the centuries the Holy Spirit has intimated to his church. It should also help illumine with the light of faith the new situations and problems which had not yet emerged in the past. It's like a holistic vision. Of course scripture is the foundation. It is the word of God. The catechism is not the word of God. Scripture is the foundation, but scripture is illuminated and enlightened and helped 
by the wisdom of the saints and the fathers, by the Holy Spirit guiding the church in her teaching. Hello and welcome. And also that we have new questions that need the Word of God to, to find answers. But they might be new questions with new answers. So for all these reasons we need contemporary teaching systematised in the Catechism. There are many different ways of, of presenting catechesis. And in fact there are many different catechetical moments within the history of the church and even within the Bible within the Old and the New Testament themselves you have moments when the teaching of the Jewish people the teaching of the new Christian community is being synthesized and, and made more relevant and, and brought to bear on the lives of the Jews and then of the Christian community so catechesis is taking place even within scriptural history and then in the history of the church since then and in Christian history there have been many catechisms Protestant as well as Catholic a key moment for Catholics was in the middle of the 16th century as a mature result of the Council of Trent we find the catechism published in 1566 and it's best known as the Catechism of St Pius V or the Roman Catechism and this was a key teaching tool for the church from the 16th century up to the 20th century and just to summarise for the sake of our own catechism a little bit of recent history we had the wonderful Second Vatican Council which was a moment when the church and especially the bishops got together to pray and reflect on the life of the church and to give new pastoral teaching to the church. This was from 1962 until 1965 and in 1985 an extraordinary synod of bishops in Rome met to celebrate and reflect on the council, the Second Vatican Council and out of that discussion in 1985 came a desire to have a catechism or a compendium of Catholic doctrine so that it could serve as a reference point for the catechisms, the local catechisms that were being developed in different countries and in different situations. It was a desire from the Catholic bishops globally to have a presentation of doctrine that would be biblical and liturgical and would present sound doctrine applied to the contemporary life of Christians. So that's a little bit of the history and why the, the, the project of developing a new catechism came about. So then it was the task of the church, of the Pope and his collaborators in communion with the bishops throughout the world to do the hard work of writing this catechism and what, a, what an incredible project it was to bring together the Christian faith and to try and put it into one book it wasn't an easy project but without going into all the details of the history the work was begun in 1986 there was a committee formed a wider group of experts discussions drafts sent round to the various bishops throughout the world revisions, more drafts, final drafts the final text was approved in 1992 and then the English translation took another two years to do it was a huge collaborative work very consultative and it really was a work of the whole church my memory, little personal anecdote is of the English translation of the Catechism the one I was just waving at you being officially launched at my seminary when I was in Rome we had a big dinner and Cardinal Ratzinger Pope Benedict, now Emeritus Pope Benedict was there at the dinner to celebrate the fact that finally we had an English translation of the Catechism and it's led when it was published obviously to be published itself was a great event 
it was felt that it needed something a little bit more accessible and bite-sized and this was the compendium of the Catechism which came out in 2006 and then the UCAT was this um, wonderful youth catechism that we know so well and that um, some of you have seen and just a quotation here about the catechism from the church this catechism is not intended to replace the local catechisms duly approved by the ecclesiastical authorities the bishops and the episcopal conferences it is meant to encourage and assist in the writing of new local catechisms which must take into account various situations and cultures while carefully preserving the unity of faith and fidelity to Catholic doctrine. In other words, this catechism is not the final word but is a help for the local churches and communities especially the local bishops and for you and me to, to make sense of our faith right here but making sure that we are connected with, with the, the full, comprehensive, faithful faith, as it were, of the whole church. Okay, that's ten minutes with a little bit of background. Now, what about the actual catechism? Where do you start? Well, this is a great challenge, and for the writers of the catechism, it was a great challenge. Where do you start if you're going to present the Catholic faith? What structure would you use? Would you start with prayer? Would you start with God and then move on to Jesus? Would you start with the sacraments? Would you start with the lives of the saints? Um, there's actually a thousand different places that you could start to tell the Christian story and I won't say a thousand but there are many different structures that you could use to structure the catechism and in the introduction to the catechism it says this catechism has repeated the old traditional order already followed by the catechism of St Pius V from the Council of Trent which is to use four parts based on first the creed second the sacred liturgy especially the sacraments third the Christian way of life using the structure of the Ten Commandments to model that third passage about the Christian moral life and four Christian prayer and spirituality and it's absolutely important to see that these four parts are related to one another and I quote here the Christian mystery is the object of faith part one what we believe it is celebrated and communicated in the liturgical actions part two liturgy sacraments it is present to enlighten and sustain the children of God in their actions part three the moral life how we actually live our lives and it is the basis for our prayer the privileged expression of which is the our father and it represents the object of our supplication, our praise and our intercession. Part 4, prayer and the spiritual life. And what's so important is that while we recognise there are four parts to the catechism, faith, sacraments, moral life, prayer, we see it as an organic whole where each part relates to the other and actually you cannot understand one part without understanding the other three these are four pillars on which our faith rests and if you take away one pillar it will all fall apart put it another way as I've said it is an organic unity to the catechism and this is what I'm going to come on to talk about now is how it all fits together it's like a mosaic it's like a painting Right, let's actually look at the Catechism now. <coughs> so, I've already said the key thing. Yep. It is 
I'm waving around a big book but when you look in the table of contents it's very clear that there are four parts to this book right? part one is more or less the basics of what we believe the content of the Christian faith which is structured around the creed so you know that the, the core elements of the Christian faith which we pray we notice the word I use we pray during the Mass every Sunday take you through the basics of Christian faith and even without understanding the catechism or the index or the cross references or anything that I'm going to come on to talk about you can open up the table of contents and you can see that it goes through um, the basics of Christian faith for example part one man's capacity for God God comes to meet man divine revelation sacred scripture what we believe and how we believe section two the profession of Christian faith in the creeds I believe in God the father almighty the creator of heaven and earth etc I won't go through it all you can look it up very easily so it's not difficult to find your way around the catechism because you know the structure of the faith and that's part one part two is about our, our worship our liturgy and especially the sacraments so there are introductory parts about what it means to worship God as a community in the liturgy introductions about sacramental theology but then it uses obviously the structure of the seven sacraments and it goes through each sacrament so each of the sacraments so that you can look up each one and read a few pages about each and know our core belief about each of the seven sacraments part three is about how we live this faith we've just talked about what we believe how we worship how do we actually live it in our ordinary lives it's under the heading of we might say for shorthand the moral life but in fact it's much more than morality and that's a key point about section 3 section 3 is entitled life in Christ what it means to live as a Christian with the Lord and it means not just morality but the life of virtue the life of being inspired by the Holy Spirit to love God and to love our neighbour the importance of the virtues of the Beatitudes of the community that helps us to live and yes it does follow the traditional patterning of the Christian moral life of using the Ten Commandments now you can imagine this is a bit artificial yeah because the Ten Commandments is if you like some building blocks of the moral life but there's lots of human and Christian life that doesn't fit tidily into one of the Ten Commandments but the Catechism puts everything more or less into one of the Ten Commandments so it puts for example all of the issues of life and death under the commandment thou shalt not kill it puts all of the issues about um, love and relationships and, and sexuality under the heading of the commandment thou shalt not commit adultery yeah. and, and everything almost about human life is fitted somewhere and some of it is a little bit artificial but it's a traditional way of saying we need some kind of structure and this helps us to, to, to build a structure and to make some sense of the whole and part four is about prayer and spirituality of course it relates to part two especially worship but it's thinking more about your personal prayer your, your spiritual life um, and it's structured around the Lord's Prayer so it uses the parts of the Lord's Prayer to help you understand in a very very beautiful way how to deepen your faith and deepen your prayer life and deepen your spirituality so first of all you know the structure you know if you want to look up something about confession where do you go? which part? part two? one of the seven sacraments if you want to look up something about the church's 
teaching about telling the truth and when lying is right and wrong where do you go? Three. part three can you guess where you go? which commandment? thou shalt not bear false witness yeah you, that's a guess but you know it's somewhere there it's to do with Christian life if you want to look up something about what Christians believe about heaven and hell where do you go? Part one, yeah, it's, it's a core part of our Christian faith, it's part of the, the creed, and it's probably near the end of the creed, isn't it? Yeah? He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Yeah? If you want to look up something about how to pray when you're feeling uh, empty and lost or joyful and excited, where do you go? Prayer. Part four, yeah? So you know the structure and you know instinctively where to go. Right. But how else can you use this? The simplest way is the index. I don't need you to teach you how to use an index. All I'm saying is it has a very, very good index. Right? With main headings and then, I can't even read this without my glasses, with multitudes of subheadings. Okay? So... And you don't have to read this catechism in fact you won't read it probably from cover to cover has anyone ever read it from cover to cover right I'm p quite pleased because it's unusual and um, well it'd be great if you had read it to co cover to cover as well but just it's not a natural book to read cover to cover it's a book to use and possibly the most use it will get is by you having it and going to the index and looking up anything you like and nearly everything that you want will be in the index somewhere right so thank God for a very intelligent user friendly big rich but uncomplicated index right so obviously the first two places you go when you want to use this is the table of context and the index the third place, again, I'm, I'm just saying the obvious. I know you're academics and you know this, but it's good to know that this is part of the catechism. The footnotes, right? The footnotes are meant to be useful. Especially the scripture references within the footnotes. So if you look up any doctrine, if you look up any controversial topic that we've been talking about in apologetics, you read the passages maybe you read a page yeah, and you think that's really interesting and then you look at the footnotes and if you've got the time you actually look up the scripture so that it can become a personal reflection and you can see the richness that this teaching is not just an abstract legalistic doctrine you have to believe this as a Catholic this is a teaching a, a life giving truth that has grown out of our, our Christian faith out of the word of God out of the experience of the saints yeah so you read a paragraph you read a chapter and you look at the footnotes next how friendly this document is yeah every section has a subsection at the end called in brief which is a summary Right? In other words, it's bullet points. Typically, you have about 10 pages. It's not even a whole chapter. Maybe a chapter's 30 pages or something. You have 6, 8, 10 pages, pretty dense, very readable, but pretty dense. And at the end, you have a box. And if you get the new CTS edition, it's a nice coloured box that says, in brief, and it has about 8 or 10 bullet points summarising the section that you've just read. So often it's best to go to the in brief section first, read it quickly, get orientated, and then if you have time to go back to the main section and read that. Sometimes you just want to look up something so obvious and all you need to do is to spend 5 minutes on a paragraph. But if there's anything slightly deep slightly interesting you have a bit more time I really encourage you if it is a section you know most section subsections are about a page long you need 10 minutes to read that page 
in other words to read it slowly and thoughtfully to, to go to the in brief bullet points at the end of the section to see how it summarises to chew it over to look at the scripture references um, especially because so many of you are talking to Protestant and Muslim friends yeah? and very often your Protestant friends and your Muslim friends are referring to Christian scripture and they know the scriptures better than you yeah? the, the Protestants know the scriptures better than you and many of your Muslim friends know your Christian scriptures better than you do have you had that experience? I have yeah, people stop me in the street Muslims and say hey did you know what it says in John 7.35 yeah? and I look nervous because I can't remember what John 7.35 says and they know these things so out of interest you should read the scriptures for your own personal prayer you should read the scriptures but for your apologetics purposes you should memorise the key scripture passages so you've got something to talk about with your Muslim and Protestant friends right and then I still haven't finished with the, the tips and the tools here so on your typical page we've got a section, a subsection, a title footnotes at the bottom um, an in brief section at the end of the section lovely quotations from the saints obviously within the text but then down the side that's not very much there can you see down the side in the margin of the catechism in the margin of the catechism can you see oh you're, you're not yeah there are little numbers and those little numbers are cross references to the catechism so it says 1853 next to this paragraph and that means go and read paragraph 18 what did I say 53 and you will find background information to this teaching that you're reading so the whole as well as being cross referenced to the Bible and the, the saints and the fathers which you have to go and look up in your Bible or look up online is cross referenced internally to give you richer teaching and richer insight and to help you to see the organic connection between the parts so if there's a bit of doctrine here yeah, it might lead you to some other doctrine that connects with that yeah. I've mentioned heaven and hell yeah, you look up heaven and hell and there might be a cross reference to the creation of man and woman yeah? do you see and, and, and that we are made in God's image and likeness to share eternal life with him and when you look there there might be a cross section to something about human intellect and will and capacity to love in the moral section and there might be a cross reference there to the importance of praying with the heart as well as with the lips and with the mind do you see there's a beautiful organic unity and every doctrine here will link to another doctrine both to help you to go deeper and to back up your doctrine so there's a kind of doctrinal catechetical point but also every doctrine will link organically to the prayer and the liturgy and the moral life so that it's not just an abstract doctrine but it's a life-giving doctrine to your prayer life and your moral life and likewise anything about your prayer life and your moral life and your worship will link back to doctrine so you can see this is about head and heart and life and community and me and others and it's all organically interconnected right what have I missed out on it's absolutely essential right there aren't many of them but what am I talking about hey now I've talked about cross references yeah, pictures. Right? There are is it is it six pictures or something? I can't remember. Right? Ah, look what I found. Right? So there are pictures in the catechism. Let me make my point before commenting on this picture. There are pictures and it was by Vatican decree that you are not allowed to print this catechism without printing the pictures in it. Why? 
because it's a tiny attempt to say our faith is more than just the written word and the written doctrine and the written truth our faith is visual as well as intellectual our faith is beauty as well as truth our faith is these places and traditions and countries that are represented by this art as well as a global universal ahistorical doctrine timeless doctrine it's not just timeless doctrine now there are only six pictures here they may not be the most helpful pictures for you they may not inspire you but you see the catechetical point that's being made about beauty and truth and history and just by chance I opened up this statue of the Virgin Mary and Jesus by Epstein do you know where it is? it's in Cavendish Square off Oxford Street just behind the John Lewis building yeah? Have you, have you ever walked past it? Yeah. yeah. So go and see it. It's, it's beautiful. You're walking through Cavendish Square and you look up and there's the Virgin Mary and Jesus and you think, wow, I'm in London. Faith is part of our wonderful city. And that's because that building used to be a convent and the sisters commissioned this statue. Okay. So, finally, how to use it. Don't be afraid, right? This is a big book, it is daunting for many people, and many people don't have one or are never reading it, and just don't read big books, yes? All you do is you look at your Facebook feeds, I know, you never read anything. Okay, let's put it out there. My simple tips, get a catechism, don't just use the online version. Get a catechism, leave it on your kitchen table, on your... Um, bedroom table, um, on your personal desk, wherever, leave it by your bed. Um, my tip is not to try and read it from start to finish. I'd say the same about the Bible. You'll probably read 20 pages in a fit of enthusiasm because my talk this evening has so inspired you, you'll stop after three days and you'll feel <laughs> guilty and disappointed. Right? This is what you can do with it. One, you can simply dip into it dip in two you can read a paragraph a day right every, every evening before going to bed every morning before coming out yeah, to read one paragraph it will take you 30 seconds and just to tick it and feel really a sense of achievement wow I've read one paragraph um, three anything that's, that has struck you that day when you get home, look it up in the index. If there's been a conversation uh, 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 in your studies, if there's been something on the news about what's been in the news recently, um, Pope Francis and nuclear weapons, yeah? look up war or violence or atomic bomb. I don't even know if it's in there in the index. Look it up in the index because the fact that it's come into your mind, it's been on your radar, um, it means it's a live question for you. You see that the church has something to say. It stimulates you. You've learned something. You're better equipped to talk about it. And it becomes a virtuous circle. The next day, you're more aware of things. What's going on in the news? What's coming up in my Facebook feed? What argument did I get into with my friend? What did the priest say in the sermon? And instead of just it fading away, you go home and you think, ah, oh, what was that thing that was buzzing around in my mind? Let me look it up. You've deepened it, you've grown, you've been active. And the action of doing something makes it deeper and, and more lasting. Obviously, another tip, if someone has asked you about something that you don't know the answer to, look it up. But because you're in the habit of doing it, it means that you enjoy looking it up. You're not afraid of the catechism. You know how easy it is to use. And look, finally, do study it. Right? It is really rich. Um, I would say it's a big book. It's dense. But honestly, it is not difficult to read. Because it's, it's in, an, in an intelligent tone of voice it's systematic, it's not patronising some of the language is, is serious and, and Christian meaning 
it, it has some assumptions built into it but nearly everything that it does it explains what it's doing and it treats you like an intelligent thoughtful layperson who doesn't have a theology degree and in that sense as intelligent thoughtful lay people without theology degrees you won't find it difficult as long as you pay attention and give it some time and give it the benefit of the doubt yeah so so actually and this is a little um, bugbear of mine the compendium of the Catholic Church which was meant to be a simplification of the catechism it's only about 100 pages is much harder than this catechism because it's tried to condense everything into a tiny little book and it hasn't worked in my view it's too dense you need the big catechism to understand the compendium yeah. but the UCAT is a really good summary of the Catholic faith it's not as rich but it's written in ordinary language um, it's not perfect it's got one or two mistakes in it but generally the UCAT is a really accessible rich book you can, you can read it very easily all the advice I've given about the UCAT about the big catechism I would also give about the UCAT have a copy by your bed dip into it look up things in the index and just finally um, the, the UCAT cross references to the catechism so when you've had your first simple answer in the UCAT you get a question in bold you have a summary answer it's like an in brief section and then I think it's in square brackets I've forgotten it gives you some numbers and those numbers are not I might have got this wrong am I right they're not references to the UCAT they're references to the big catechism right and it also has cross references to the UCAT I need to, I need to go and check this stay there yeah, yeah, I'm right. I've got the UCAT. So, I remembered correctly, thank goodness. So in the UCAT you get a question, then you get a summary answer, and then at the end of the summary answer, in square brackets, you have some references, and they are to the big catechism. And then you also get other internal references um, within the, the UCAT itself. But that's why, do you see again, it's so good to have the big catechism, you read something in the, in the UCAT, you think that's really helpful. It's actually a bit quick. It doesn't quite explain all the reasoning behind it. But it makes you want to go to the big catechism. Yeah? So you need both a UCAT and a big catechism. You need to have them in your bedroom. You need to dip into them. And you will really enjoy them. I finish with Pope Benedict's introduction to the UCAT quote many people say to me the youth of today are not interested in this catechisms Christian teaching etc Pope Benedict said I disagree and I am certain that I am right the youth of today are not as superficial as some think they want to know what life is really about a detective story is exciting because it draws us into the destiny of other men a destiny that could be ours this book, the UCAT, is exciting because it speaks of our own destiny and so deeply engages every one of us. So I invite you, he says, study this catechism. This is my heartfelt desire. This catechism was not written to please you. It will not make life easy for you because it demands of you a new life. It places before you the gospel message as the pearl of great value for which you must give everything. So I beg you, he's writing about the UCAT, but I'm applying it to the big catechism. Pope Benedict says, I beg you, study this catechism with passion and perseverance. Make a sacrifice of your time for it, exclamation mark. Study it in the quiet of your room. Read it with a friend. Form study groups and networks. Share with each other on the internet. By all means, by all means, continue to talk to each other about your faith. You need to understand it like a good musician knows the piece he is playing. Yes, you need to be more deeply rooted in the faith that the generation of your parents... Sorry, you need to be more deeply rooted in the faith 
than the generation of your parents so that you can engage the challenges and temptations of this time with strength and determination. You need God's help if your faith is not going to dry up like a dewdrop in the sun, if you want to resist the blandishments of consumerism, if your love is not to drown in pornography, if you are not going to betray the weak and leave the vulnerable helpless. You need to read the Catechism. There we go. End of talk. And I've got an extra thought for you, but I'm going to press the pause button now.